Coming up, launches. Next step, Tabby Star. In our main topic, we talk about small sats. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to Tomorrow, Season 9, Episode 24 for Saturday, August 13th, 2016. Coming to you live from Station 204. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. Now, before we get started with today's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more and helped us enable Station 204, our brand new studio. Uh, they're the ones who made all of this happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our patrons. If you'd like to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now we're gonna have an abbreviated After Dark this week, uh, but in that After Dark, we will be talking about the new studio space. Uh, it is fairly plain and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But bef before After Dark, We've got some awesome space news. We've been off the air for a good month or so, so a lot has happened. Yes. Rather than covering all of the launches that have happened in the last month, we're just going to kind of cover the last couple. So let's go ahead and start on Friday, August 5th at 12, uh, 1622 Coordinated Universal Time. This particular one has a lot of B-roll in advance, so go ahead and just roll that data. Uh, here, there you go. Here, there it is rolling to the launch site. Uh, this is a Long March 3B carrying the Ting Tong 1 uh, satellite, is, which is different than the Tian Gong one, which is their space station. Uh, this is the 10th launch for Ch uh, China in 2016, and Tian Tong one is the first satellite of China's homemade satellite mobile telecom system. Basically meaning that it's going to connect people if you're on the move, instead of having to have like those giant, enormous antennas, you'll just have like these small radio kind of things, and you'll be able to have connectivity back to the China telecom system. So. Uh, that's actually all sped up quite a bit, that footage that you're looking at right now, and here is the actual launch coverage itself. Absolutely beautiful. I believe right now China is the world leader for 2016 in number of launches uh, above any other country. Uh, actually, I take it back. U.S. It's might actually have... Russia. Is it Russia? It's actually Russia. Russia is first right now. United States closely followed in second place and very closely followed now by China in third place. But yeah. China will soon overtake us if we're not careful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all like, it's all, well, no, they will, won't they? Because they, they've got a bunch of launches coming up and we don't have that many launches. And, and the American launches are slipping, so... Yeah. <laughs> There's a good chance they will. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, congrats to China for that. We, they also had a Long March 4C launch. That was Tuesday, August 9th, 2255, coordinated universal time. That's the Galefin 3 radar imaging satellite. Basically, that's going to survey oceans, crops, and resources, as uh, well as help for uh, natural disaster observ uh, observations. Uh, it's an eight-year mission to capture high resolution of all-weather imagery of Earth, and the all-weather capability basically means that they're not only going to have visible light cameras on board, but also a radar so that they can actually look through the clouds and look through the weather to see what's going on on Earth itself. This is the sixth satellite to launch in that particular series. All right, Mike, talk to us about next step. Oh man, I'm super excited about this. So NASA has a program called Next Step that they're kind of modeling after the commercial crew and commercial cargo programs in the sense that it's a private-public partnership and it's a Space Act agreement instead of uh, FAR contract contracting. That's a kind of a, a big deal for that. But the whole thing with this is before they had selected four companies to develop space habitats and several other companies to develop you know, advanced technologies for the next generation of deep space exploration. Some of those were for propulsion, some of those were just for minor subsystems, Systems, better life support systems, but this next contract for the Next Step 2 contract that has recently come out, they've chosen six companies to just pursue the space habitat work. And we have uh, uh, several images, and, and these are the, the companies that they have selected for this. They have Bigelow Aerospace that is developing their X-Space idea, and what that is is using their B-330 to attach that to the International Space Station. And then we have Boeing, which is basing their modules off of the same modules that they built previously for the 
International Space Station. And then we have Lockheed Martin, which is basing their ideas off of the multi-purpose logistics module, as well as the work that they've done for the Orion capsule and all those different pressurized uh, functions that they can have with those. And then there's also Orbital ATK, which has kind of scaled back their ideas a little bit compared to the Next Step 1 solicitations. And then there are two new companies, and these are the ones that I'm pretty excited about. The first of those, these new two companies are Sierra Nevada, which is basing their hardware off of the cargo section for their Dream Chaser Cargo, the service module of that. And they're even working on inflatables. In this picture here, that is not a Bigelow module that they're going to be attaching. That is work on their own inflatables that they might be doing for this. And then finally, the one that I am most excited about is actually a collaboration between NanoRacks, Space Systems Laurel, and United Launch Alliance under the name Ixion. I believe it's pronounced Ixion. And this is incredible. This is a harder. This is going back to the days when we were doing Skylab, turning an, an upper stage into a, a wet workshop or dry workshop, depending on if you already did work on it previously. And the, the concept of this study is that they could potentially turn any upper stage into a usable space habitat. And right now, the, the focus on that is, is turning a centaur stage into a, a usable space habitat, as you can see in the picture there. And obviously, since United Launch Alliance is the partner on that, that makes sense. But here's the cool thing about this. The first four companies I mentioned that previously had already had contracts, they're actually going to be building working prototypes. And especially in the case of Bigelow, it looks like their whole X-Space idea of attaching one of their B-330s to the International Space Station is highly likely now. That looks a lot better. And the other two companies for NanoRacks and doing the idea of the wet workshops and is for Sierra Nevada, theirs is just a study, the concept study, and coming up with a proposal to see how they would work. So there's no guarantee that either Sierra Nevada or the NanoRacks idea will move forward. But with the prototypes that are being built by the other four companies, it seems like one of these will at least be selected. And it might not necessarily be for what we think. This whole program is for the purpose of being able to send space habitats to cis lunar space and eventually to be able to go to Mars and to be able to survive that long journey. So I'm really excited about this, that the, the, the benefits of this program could go in lots of different directions. And I'm really excited about that. So very cool stuff. And I'm looking forward to see how it progresses from here on out. One interesting fact I learned at the day job, uh, which I, I haven't mentioned to anyone, so you wouldn't know, uh, Space Systems Laurel is actually no longer to be referred to as Space Systems Laurel, but only as SSL. I don't know where that comes from, but they are now known only as SSL. All right. Fun little uh, fact. SSL. Now you know. There you go. That's half the battle. Uh, Jared, talk to me about mysteriously dimming objects. Oh yes, mysteriously dimming objects. Now, uh, I actually did a space pod about this last year, and uh, some very interesting stuff has come out about the most mysterious star in our galaxy, known as KIC 8462852. But you can also call it Tabby Star, uh, if you'd like That's to. That's way easier. Um, yeah, we've also uh, called it the WTF star, called the Where's the Flux? Star, uh, looking for the flux and the light from it. Um, but this star is very interesting. It was discovered by citizen scientists using data from the Kepler Space Telescope on a website called planethunters.org. And basically what you do on planethunters.org is you look at light curves. So basically you look at the light curve from a star. If there's a planet there, your light curve should have a nice dip in it and then come out because as that planet moves in front of the star, it causes the light to dim and then it comes back as it moves out of the star. So you see a transit of an exoplanet across the star. Well, this star had a light curve that looked a little something like this, you know, and it would go down really deep and then come back up and then down really deep and then come back up. And everybody was kind of like, what's going on here? It's an it's alien rave party. Obviously, that's what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's what the internet assumed. And that's what a lot of people were very mad at me in my space pod for not admitting to what it was. Um, <laughs> but um, there are some ideas for what's causing this chaotic dip in the light, which is some of them, uh, one of the main scientific explanations for it is that there's a swarm of comets going around and we kind of have like a little artist conception here that shows you um, what something like that may look like. Um, they've also said that there could be a lumpy disk of material around the star. So basically you have a disk of material there like you would with a new solar system forming or maybe two planets collided at some point um, and one part of that disk may have more stuff in it and has a higher density than the other parts of that disk. Um, also Star spots are a possible explanation for that as well. It's not just the sun that gets spots on it. Stars also get them that. Um, and then, of course, there was also the alien megastructures, uh, Dyson Sphere, 
possible explanation um, because actually, very weirdly, uh, some computer modeling that's been done to try to f figure out what a Dyson sphere may look like actually kind of matched up with what uh, this uh, light curve ended up looking like. But that's probably not the, uh, the actual explanation for it because you don't want to go too fantastical um, immediately. I feel like Alien Rave you is know, like is right on. That would be the really cusp cool. Too fantastical Gosh. slash possible. That would be so <laughs> cool, but you know that would also be like um, a huge disappointment uh, <laughs> if that's what ended up actually being it. But some scientists have looked back at a century's worth of observation of the star on these photographic plates. And they've actually found that the star, which I will not say its name again, I'll just say Tabby Star, uh, has actually been slowly dimming over the past century. Mm -hmm. And then, if that wasn't enough for you, once Kepler started looking at it in 2009, it started to dim at about 0.3% of its brightness every year. So. We don't really have a good reason to explain how that can actually happen with the star. Like, like a little bit of brightness dipping, okay, we can, we can kind of do that. But 0.3% is a massive amount of brightness to lose per year. In Star so, Wars, don't they suck the star into do? the weapon? Maybe yeah, that? Yeah, my <laughs> husband, Kylo Ren, um, was very important to that. But unfortunately... Um, that probably isn't real. You know, just like the alien rave probably or the real. mega structures. Probably it's not probably real. Probably not yeah. what we're actually. I'm just going to go out on a limb here. So say you're not saying not. it's aliens, but um, probably aliens? I'm, it, you know, I'm saying it's not aliens, mm. but <laughs> even though I'm saying it's most likely not aliens, people will be like, there's still a chance and uh, run with it. As so far you're as telling they can. me there's a chance. Yes, exactly. So an interesting thing. As we're saying, the most mysterious star in our galaxy has gotten even more mysterious now that we've started studying it. That's actually so, kind of cool. Yeah, and that's what yeah. I love about science, is that you can, you can think you've got something figured out, and nature's like, nope, <laughs> curveball in the dirt in front of you. So Figure that one out. Yeah, Boom. good luck, scientists. Actually, cool thing, um, uh, the scientists who were studying the star actually did a Kickstarter for $100,000 to uh, get more time on telescopes to study the star, mm -hmm. and they made it. They got 107% funded. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to be doing much more detailed study of this, and maybe within the next year we'll we find out. We should highlight more of those is. Kickstarter campaigns yeah. when we see them. Very yeah. cool. I feel like very cool. the community of tomorrow would love to see those things and possibly contribute and Absolutely. be a part of that, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're cool like that. Very cool. All right, moving on. Yes, let's All move right. on. Speaking of really cool things, uh, oh, the oh, oh, oh. yeah, the video nerd in me <sighs> couldn't pass this particular story up. Uh, I know. Oh Just my gosh. Just go ahead and show the footage. Uh, so yeah, we're all oh. isn't that amazing. Here's why this is cool. So this is a very special camera. Mm. Uh, it's called uh, mm. it's the High Dynamic Range Stereo X or High Res X. Uh, Here's why this is important and cool. Rocket fire is very bright, and cameras have a limitation of something called dynamic range, which is, in its simplest form, the difference between the brightest part of the scene and the darkest part of the scene. And if the brightest part of the scene, if that, that distance is too great and the thing that's too bright is too different from the thing that's too dark, uh, one of them has to suffer. Either it's, the whole scene has to be too dark in order to compensate for the really bright thing, or the whole th scene has to be too bright to compensate for the really dark thing. But you can never have everything on the screen at the same time. What you're looking at is everything on the screen at the same time. You can actually see the plume. Oh. Isn't that great? That's really cool. They do this using uh, something called high, it's high dynamic range. You basically don't have a camera that can do this with one single exposure. So they take multiple exposures at the same time, and then they marry them back together to create this particular image. The reason this is really cool on top of that is it's high frame rate, because consider you have to have a single camera doing this at a really high frame rate and have to do it multiple times per frame, not just per second, but multiple times per frame. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's just... It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, NASA developed this, uh, I'm sorry, NASA's Dennis Space Center in Mississippi developed this. What you're looking at here is the SM2 qualification test that happened on June 28th. Uh, NASA partnered with Innovative Image and Research Corporation to develop this system. And um, yeah, it just, it, it 
looks absolutely stunning. This is fantastic, because uh, like I was saying with Dutta uh, last week when we first saw this, this is sort of like the stuff that, uh, that the engineers and the propulsion system people have always wanted to see, but you really haven't been able to see it because you've had to make that sacrifice. Yeah, you have to um, choose bright or dark, you just can't have both. So yeah. this is this is like, this, I just, I oh my gosh. A gr really great example of, of this exact problem is any rocket launch at night, as soon as the engine ignites, the only thing you see is the fire from the engine. You really can't yes. see much of the rocket anymore mm -hmm. because it's simply too dark. Right? Yeah. The, the engine is too bright and the rest of the rocket is too dark. Something like this might help. Now, I don't know that these cameras really work live because it is a high dynamic range. Probably not. Yeah, probably not, but uh, it's, you know, maybe someday. Yeah. Right? I mean, do real time. Uh, yeah. But right now, it looks like this is engineering footage. This is, this is stuff that people are going to go back and review and take a look at and say, how does this match up with our models that we've been working on? And so. the great thing is, because it's high speed, you can actually see the gimbaling of the engine itself. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can actually see it go through its tests and actually, like, you know, kind of do the basic steering and whatnot. I think yeah. they did some throttling on the solid motor as well. Uh, so, and the solid motors are. Just super extra bright, right? I mean, those yes. things are just—they're like the really sun. Hot. They are. They're like a miniature sun, and so uh, being able to capture that in that kind of uh, detail and range is incredible. So the video nerd in me, <sighs> nerd gas, I'm down on that. It the was engineering gorgeous. nerd in me kind of lost it. Yeah, we need a lot more of that footage. Of any, uh, <laughs> need a napkin. Oil. All right, uh, I'm being told too many nerd gasms. So let's okay. head, head back over to space, Mike. Talk to me about the uh, HTV. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, all that stickiness made me ugh. Gross! <laughs> anyway, so HTV, the Japanese Space Agency, or rather the, the Japanese Aerospace Research Center, JAXA, their cargo vessel, the HTV Conatori, has been delayed. It was supposed to be launched in September and now is going to be moved back. The soonest that it will hopefully be launched is in October. And the reason for this delay is because of a, a leaky fuel line in the, the service module of this cargo vessel. But it has a couple unintended benefits. The, the whole thing about this is that there is an extra EVA that they want to do at the space station right now to have an extra ex extra vehicular activity in order to do some repair, much needed repairs on the space station. And the whole thing with this is with their, their spacecraft, <coughs> The next spacecraft that was going to be coming after this, or rather before this, was going to be Orbital ATK Cygnus vehicle, and they're actually still having a couple of problems with their remodeled Antares rocket. So they're going to push back the Antares and Cygnus launch a little bit further into September. The whole thing is they would have, with the problems that they're having, they would have had to have launched and burst the Cygnus to the International Space Station and unbirthed it by September 10th in order to make way for the HTV vehicle to, to launch to the station and berth by September 22nd. So because of this, they can, they can relax a little bit and work out what they need to for the Antares rocket. In the meantime, the Dragon capsule that is currently docked up at the, at the International Space Station will be unberthed and sent back home. And the, the primary cargo that the Dragon brought up there, the new International Docking Adapter, astronauts Jeff Williams and Kate Rubens are going to be installing that onto the International Space Station very soon. I believe that is on August, or excuse me, September 1st. And then they're going to be doing their extra EVA on September 10th. And what they're going to be doing with that is they're going to be taking an old radiator that actually broke down back in 2012 that has just been waiting to be removed. They already fixed the problem and replaced what they need to in order to get everything working to clean out all the ammonia in the atmospheric pressure that they have there. But the, the old broken unit is still there. So that needs to be removed so it can be thrown away eventually. Plus they're going to check out some truss segments on the solar panels that have been vibrating recently and make sure that everything's going okay with that. They might install a new light and maybe a new camera and just do some, some needed activities. And all this just in time before Jeff Williams returns back to Earth. So very cool that even though it's a delay and we all kind of groan a little bit that things get delayed, there are some good benefits to this and a couple of m more things that they're going to be able to do at the space station while they're waiting for these new cargo vehicles to come up later on. So you take the good with the bad. Maybe they could install one of those new high dynamic range cameras while they're at it. Yes. That'd be awesome. That they said it was well. a new HD camera and didn't uh, really go into more detail. All so. right. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold them to our promise of <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll get right on that. I'm sure they will. Uh, Cassini. 
Yes, going <laughs> out to the outer solar system. Cassini, one of my favorite missions, launched in 1997. When Why I was, is it one of your favorites? Um, because it's been such a long-lasting mission, and all of the images that come back from that mission are just unbelievably, I just, I, it's such a, Saturn and all of the moons around it are such a beautiful place. Um, and launched in 1997 when I was in fourth grade, uh, went into orbit in 2004, um, and has been operating in, sat in the environment around Saturn since then. And it has found- You were in fourth grade in 1997? Yes, I was. Okay, So Yeah, Keep when going. it was launched. Um, it has found very steep canyons on Saturn's moon Titan, and they are filled with liquid methane. So Titan represents, this actually represents the first direct observation of channels of liquid methane on Titan. And Titan is the largest of Saturn's moons. It is the only moon to have its own atmosphere. It's actually a thick enough atmosphere that if you visit it, that uh, onto the surface of Titan, all you'd need is a life support system to provide that oxygen and to scrub that uh, carbon dioxide away and thermal protection because it's uh, really, really cold. It's like minus uh, 175 degrees Celsius on the surface there, so very, very cold. Um, but you wouldn't need a pressure suit to actually visit there. And it also is the only celestial body besides Earth that we know of that has an active liquid cycle, but instead of water making a water cycle like it does here on Earth, it's liquid methane. So you actually have like a liquid hydrocarbon cycle on Titan. Now these canyons, they have very steep sides. They're in excess of 40 degrees and they contain liquid methane that's up to several hundred meters deep. So this was done using Cassini's radar imaging system, which allows them to look at Titan's surface in incredible detail through that thick atmospheric haze. Now, how did they figure out that there was liquid methane there and how deep it was? Well, they looked at the difference between the reception time of the radar signals from the sides and the bottoms of the canyons. And another neat thing about liquids in radar is that they'll actually make a little glint. So if you send a signal to them, some of that signal will go all the way through the liquid to the bottom and come back up, but a little bit of that signal will actually reflect off of the surface of that liquid. So they looked at that glint and they, did, they basically looked at the time that the signals were received from the sides, the bottoms, and the glint of the liquid methane, and they were able to figure out how deep these methane channels were. So this actually helps us prove that there is some, uh, some sort of either long-term what I would call liquid hydrocarbon cycle going on on the surface of Titan. Is that what you would Titan. call it? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no, nobody's really come up with like an official name for this, this cycle. Um, or that the erosion on Titan via liquid hydrocarbons occurs much faster than predicted. So they're going to have a couple more flybys of Titan where they're going to be able to examine this. Um, but very interesting that this, that this happens here. Um, and just, you know, unbelievable that this is just within our own solar system. In this sort of alien world with its, own, with its own oceans and rivers, but not of water, but of liquid methane. And now we know that there's actual channels of liquid methane that flow along Titan, and we've seen them, and that they're actually there. Adrian so. C. wants to know if it also rains methane? It does rain methane on Titan. Like I said, it's literally a liquid hydrocarbon cycle. So that, you know, you'll have liquid hydrocarbon that evaporates into the clouds that then rains back down and goes through those channels down into these oceans or these lakes or these very small, like, ponds of liquid hydrocarbons. It's just, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It so, would smell terrible. Would smell terrible. You gotta uh, leave your helmet on. Yeah, you definitely would. Mm -hmm. um, cool thing, uh, liquid hydrocarbons, when they rain, the raindrops move unbelievably slow. They fall at maybe a couple centimeters per second. <laughs> so you really? could actually sort of run between uh, the rain on Titan if you wanted to, if you went there. So That would be awesome. Yeah. Now I kind of want to see that. Yeah. But this. I really need to leave my suit on. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about small sats. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lies. Films on some expectation. This girl's a fascination.
and welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into our main topic, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the Patreon premiere members. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We have also got our tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And those two different reward levels uh, have, of course, different things that you get for each one. If you'd like to find out what those things are, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And again, a tremendous shout out to our patrons. You, our patrons, our citizens of tomorrow, are the ones who have enabled us to get this space to actually expand and enhance the show. Yeah, I know. It yeah. looks bad. I realize it looks like we're shooting <laughs> against a beige wall. Yeah, to be fair, though, uh, that we kept the thermostat out of the shot. Barely. Yes. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> All I need to do is pan a little bit more left, and you'll see the thermostat. Uh, but you guys have enabled this, and uh, you're going to see us build up this space over the course of the, the remainder of the year. Uh, and I, I hope you enjoy what you see. I, I hope you like what's, what happens here mm -hmm. in front of you. And uh, like I said, we'll talk more about that in After Dark. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our main topic, which is small sat launchers. Uh, well, I'm sorry, small sats in general, not the launchers. Um, uh, you, you know, we were kind of going back and forth as to what we should talk about. There was this small sat conference that just occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I put it out in the, in the Patreon um, premier member room because they've got their own little chat room. They, we, we all talk to each other on. And... Um, said, hey, is this something that's of interest? And the general consensus that came back was, I, yes, it's interesting because I don't understand the value of small sats. Or, mm -hmm. or maybe they, there was kind of a who cares sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got different companies that are working feverishly to building these low-cost small sat launchers. You've got Virgin Galactic with Launcher 1. You've got Firefly Space Systems. They just recently did some engine tests that mm -hmm. looked amazing. Yeah. And you've got Rocket Labs with their, uh, that's the Electron rocket, right? Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, just to name a few, right? So you've got all these companies working towards it, but why? Right? You look at a Falcon 9, you look at an Atlas 5, you look at a Delta 4, even the Long March series, the, the Ar Ariane 5, all those other rockets, they're designed to carry big, huge, massive payloads, and that's what we think of when we think of space systems. Mm -hmm. So, who care? Why do small sats matter? So, uh, if it's all right, Space Mike, I'll start with you. Why should people care? What are small sats, and why should people care about them? Well, I mean, the definition for small sats is uh, kind of kind of wide. I mean, it can be anything from you know a tiny little uh, cube sat or even a pico sat to something that is a little bit bigger, like the size of your microwave or something like that. And I think the thing that is important with this is that technology is getting smaller. I mean, we've all known that for a long time. That's pretty obvious in today's world. But we can do so much with smaller satellites that have just as much, if not way more capability than a lot of the satellites that we've put up in the past. And especially with CubeSats, they're a little bit more focused with that. You might be able to do a, a small communications network with them, or you might be able to do Earth observation with them, or a, one dedicated science experiment, or a few, a few if you're clever enough to, to get things in there. And you can have, you can do a lot with these small satellites, especially if you're putting up more than one of them. And there's lots of opportunities with these things, and I feel like the opportunities are, are becoming a, a lot more available to the people who are building these. I mean, when I first heard about CubeSats a couple of years ago, and, you know, buy your own kit for $15,000, I wanted to do that, but then, you know, pay for your own rocket launch for $20 million plus, and that pretty much killed the idea for me. But it's becoming a lot cheaper. I mean, I've, I've raved about how United Launch Alliance offers free rides every once in a while on, the, on their launches. And for other launches, SpaceX is going to be doing a launch with, a, I believe it's called Sherpa. I believe that's how you pronounce it. It's pretty much a, a, a hosted payload adapter that would ha be able to carry dozens of small satellites, you know, from, from just small CubeSats to the microwave or even, you know, almost refrigerator sized small sats. And with that, you can be able to launch a lot of these things. So you have all of these companies and, and small startups who are making all of these smaller rockets that would be dedicated rockets for small satellites. But a lot of the big guy, the big companies are competing by being able to launch multiple small satellites at once. So I feel like there's a lot more opportunity now than there was just a couple of years ago. And as technology continues to get smaller and become more powerful, we'll be able to do just more and more and more and more 
with this stuff. And even with CubeSats, I mean, there's companies, serious companies like Aerojet Rocketdyne who are coming out with unique propulsion systems for CubeSats and even advanced Earth departure stages so that you could have them ride on, on a launch that would be a secondary payload on, say, a communication satellite. And although it might start off in the same orbit or transfer orbit, rather, it would have its own small chemical stage to be able to go to whatever destination it needs to. And you can, and the, I mean, the bigger it is, the bigger uh, chemical stages you can bring along with it. But I mean, as things continue to get smaller, the more and more that we can do with it. And just, it just blows my mind how, how the technology continues to grow and uh, grow microly in, in a sense. <laughs> grow microly. <laughs> I don't think that's even a word, but <laughs> it is now, Space Mike. So what, what you make up words all the time. <laughs> I'm allowed. <laughs> uh, 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 but so, what are some of the things we can do with these small sats like today, right? I, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there was the light sail project that went up not that long ago, kind of testing new propulsion. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, what are some real life examples of things that we can do with a small sat right now that people should care about? Either weather way. data. All right. Boom. That's something that affects everybody. But why not just use a regular weather satellite? What's the advantage of a small set over a regular satellite for weather data? Well, because a lot of weather data, most of the weather data that we get isn't even from satellite data. A lot of the weather data that we get is from the, the radar Doppler towers uh, in your local area. Most of it isn't even the satellite data. So if we had a good enough satellite network, and maybe there would be multiple companies doing this, you know, if you had a really good, you know, dedicated satellite weather observation system that would be giving you the most accurate data that you possibly could, you know, that we would be able to plan better and, and and just be able to do things better, in my opinion. Uh, you? What are some of the cool things? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, some, on the propulsion side, there's lots of stuff that you could do with solar sails. And NASA's really gotten into the idea of using solar sails as the main propulsion system for these small satellites that they're going to launch. Um, like on Exploration Mission 1, um, the first flight of the space launch system, they're going to be firing off multiple secondary payloads uh, for CubeSats. Um, there's a couple... They could carry. Uh, how they can carry a lot of CubeSats. How many CubeSats can... God, just like the world supply of CubeSats. All yeah. it was just like... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're going to carry... That's kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're going to carry um, one of... Uh, one of uh, two of them are my favorites of the CubeSats that have been pr proposed so far. Of the three that are my favorites. I know I just said two favorites, three favorites. Um, <laughs> there's one called Lunar Flashlight, which is a six-unit CubeSat that's going to use a solar sail. It's going to actually put itself into a polar orbit around the moon using its solar sail. Um, and then once it flies over these areas of what we call eternal darkness, so those spots Sounds in the ominous. solar, uh, the solar, the southern pole uh, of the moon, where they're permanently shadowed, um, they are going to actually angle the solar sail so that the light will reflect off of the sail and down into those permanently shadowed areas. And they're going to have infrared sensors on board uh, that will allow them to read the spectrum of the light coming back and figure out what, what precisely is in there. Is it just regolith from the moon? Is it, is it water ice, methane ice? What's the composition? How much Cheese. of it is actually there? Cheese, uh, um, you know, uh, Swiss or Lindenberg or... <laughs> Uh, Gouda, you know, just whatever could possibly be there. Um, another one they're doing is called Near Earth Asteroid Scout. And they, they prefer to call it Nia Scout because that sounds cooler. Um, and, Does it? Uh, huh? Does it? No, I don't think so. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it sounds very silly. But they're going to find a near Earth asteroid that it will deploy its solar sail to and rendezvous with. And the cool thing about this is that if you have a small satellite and you have a big solar sail for it, the, they're going to be able to fly by the asteroid and then turn the solar sail and come back around and fly by again and turn the solar sail and come back around and fly by again. So it's not just, you know, they're going to fly by once like uh, certain missions that NASA has flown has already done. Uh, they're going to be able to fly by it multiple times. So if there's something interesting they see in the first flyby and they're like, oh, we'd like to do that, uh, to see that again, but from a different angle, they can you know move the solar sail and work with that. Um, also, one of my favorite ones is an upcoming part of NASA's InSight Mars lander called Mars Cube 1. So back in 1999, Mars Polar Lander didn't uh, land on the surface. It crashed. Um, and we It had an impact event. Yeah, it did. It litho-braked, um, but it wasn't designed to litho-brake. So, um, <laughs> so it was a bit of a problem, and they weren't receiving live telemetry from the vehicle or tones or anything from the vehicle 
for them to understand what happened to it. So there's been this requirement for things that land on Mars from here on out that they have to have live telemetry. Well, that you know, takes a lot of coordinational effort with the assets you have on orbit, with the vehicles on orbit and around Mars, or you gotta have a really powerful uh, transmitter built in onto your spacecraft. So in the case of InSight, they're actually launching two six unit CubeSats that all they are going to do is they are going to fly along with InSight, not land on Mars, but they're gonna fly above where InSight is. InSight will relay the data to them and then they will relay the data back to Earth. So they're basically these two telecommunication relays so that InSight doesn't have to carry a big, heavy transmitter to talk it just has to have directly enough. back. It just has to, be, has to be able to get up to this, the CubeSat, and mm -hmm. then the CubeSat has to have a big enough transmitter to relay it back to Earth. Exactly. That's so interesting. That's a pretty, I think that's a pretty brilliant idea. Are we going to see similar things here around Earth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got a, a current problem at the Tomorrow Studio uh, <laughs> Station 204 is uh, bandwidth, right? Yeah. I mean, getting bandwidth here is actually painfully yeah. hard. Is this something... Can, can we use CubeSats at yes. a fairly low altitude to get gigabit speeds? Yes, and even, even cooler things, um, if you are at the North or South Pole, you have a very difficult time communicating sure. because you know most satellites that communicate are in geosynchronous orbit. So actually, if you deploy a small satellite with a solar sail, you can put it in an orbit where it's geosynchronous but not in geosynchronous orbit. You can actually have a geosynchronous orbit over the North Pole or over the South Pole. There's actually these very interesting trajectories where you can put your satellite at where its orbit will basically have it hover within an area where you can communicate with parts on the Earth that geosynchronous That's would otherwise have. That's got to have a name. What's have, the name? It's not a polar orbit because that basically mm -hmm, goes around. Right. No, these are so orbits. You're talking about a halo orbit? They're kind, no, of, they're yeah, yeah. kind of like halo orbits. I guess that would be a good way to do it. So, yeah, but they're I didn't not. Know that they're that not was at, they're not at like the areas where the Earth, the Earth and the Sun's gravity balances you out. It's simply just using a solar sail that balance you in that specific spot. And that, that's very interesting to me is the wow. idea that you could literally provide direct communications to areas on Earth that you usually have a very difficult time doing that. So we can use, I, I mean, I, I'm asking these questions uh, basically to start conversations about mm -hmm. this, but it seems like uh, CubeSats, NanoSats, uh, all of these smaller satellites are actually the future of space-based communication, space-based satellites, and then we're moving, collectively moving away from these ginormous satellites that require dedicated multi-hundred million dollar launches mm -hmm. to these really tiny things that, you know, if it fails, that's okay, I got 20 more of them yeah. that, that I'll just spin one up and, and move it into wherever it needs to go. And, and generally, in we'll say, I'm making this number up, but like 80% of the cases, they're just as good as their counterparts from a decade ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that are up in orbit, but they're way less expensive, way easier to get a, uh, on orbit, and um, you can just service them by dropping a new one in there. Yeah, and um, a cool thing that I actually learned a couple days ago is that JPL is, has an entire division dedicated just to developing systems to take them from really big satellites to fit them into small sats. Hmm. And they've actually already developed a suite for timing, navigation, and uh, transmission and X-band that fits into CubeSats. Um, from the work that they've done. I, so. can, I can totally see like CubeSat cool. kits coming around of like, hey, here's your prop kit, here's your, you just snap yeah. them all together, you yeah. choose what you want, and The ultimate in modular design. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be the slogan of stuff. Tomorrow, the ultimate in modular design. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Karen, uh, was there anything in the chat room? I, there's a, been a bunch of stuff kind of going back and forth. I know we're having a few chat room issues, but right. is there anything uh, that they've been... Um, well, Kay McCoy asks, uh, do small sets have similar deorbit requirements as standard satellites? That's a good question because you could you have space junk problems still. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I yeah, and go ahead, Mike. And and you have to 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 notice the different classes too. I mean, we've been using small sats pretty generally since we've been talking about this. But I mean, small sats are are, are you know the the technical definition is small sats are from a certain weight onwards, and then there's pico sats and there's nano sats and and. So the bigger ones, they definitely do have the same requirements as a lot of the bigger ones. With CubeSats, that's been a little bit shaky because most of the CubeSats that have been able to be put on orbit have been in a very low Earth orbit and just degrade very quickly and, and reorbit, or at least only a couple of years as they'll be up there. For now that we're starting to get into the range now that we're starting to put you know these really tiny satellites into medium Earth orbit or and even aiming for high Earth orbits, 
Now things are a little bit different. And even though requirements might be put out, unless they have a propulsion system or a, a, a solar sail or something that they could deorbit the spacecraft with, how would they be able to comply to those demands? So it's kind of a, a sketchy situation with the really, really the smallest of the satellite classes. But a lot of the bigger ones that I, I would almost call industrial small sats, <laughs> those definitely have the same requirements as their much bigger counterparts. Wait, so like the large small sats as opposed to the medium and small small yeah, sats? Yeah, the, micro the, the microwave sized small sats compared to the, the cube set small yeah, sats. Yeah, so major <laughs> small sats, minor small sm sats, dwarf small sats, you know, just the yeah. usual <laughs> classification with it. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it does seem like small sats are the future, though. I'd love to know what you guys think, the community of tomorrow. Uh, leave your comments. Uh, what is your favorite small sat project that you've heard of going on right now? What's the thing that you want to see small sats doing? And do you think the small sats are the future as opposed to these ginormous sats? I, obviously, you're, we're, it's not like either or, right? It's not like you can yeah. only have small sats and you can only have large sats. But uh, it feels like the industry is trending towards smaller satellites, mm -hmm. less expensive satellites, which means they're going to potentially be trending towards less expensive launchers, smaller launchers, mm -hmm. depending, of course, on where it's going. So, yes. um, you know, the payload will dictate the rocket and everything else, so th this could actually change the industry. So, you know, the, the Firefly space systems of the world, the Virgin Galactics mm. and the rocket labs of the world, they could end up being the, the launchers that launch consistently, like more than the large launchers out there, yeah. you know, someday in the not too distant future. So what do you think? Leave your comments on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you want, on Patreon. And uh, speaking of comments, when we, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, comments from our last show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. Long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. The eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get to our comments from our last show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment and this studio go. These are the uh, tomorrow premiere members. They've contributed ten dollars or more to this specific episode. We've also got a tomorrow producers who've contributed five dollars or more to this specific episode. But wait, there's more. We've got our Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who've contributed $2.50 or more. They're also gonna get access to After Dark as soon as it is available online, uh, as well as our uh, Hangouts. And actually, they got a Hangout with us talking about this studio space mm -hmm. uh, before we went live, and they got some of the first information on this. And we've also got our patrons. These are the people who've contributed between one dollar, I'm sorry, one penny, and two dollars and forty-nine cents. So that's right. As little as one penny per episode gets your name in the show. To find out all the different reward levels and awesome things that you can get, head on over to Patreon.com/tmro. Every single penny helps, and it enables us to do cool things like Station Two Zero Four. All right, let's go ahead and get started thank from you comments. So much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. We, I, we 
could not do this without you. And I think you're going to really like what we have in store. It's going to take us a little bit of time because uh, we elevated. You know, the, the, the studio was always a plan, right? We've been talking about this for years. So this isn't really a surprise. But we made it happen faster than we had originally anticipated. So because of that, we have to move some funds around and do some wacky things. But uh, we'll talk about all that in After Dark. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Capcom, comments. <laughs> Ready, go. This first one comes off of YouTube from Pony Bottle. Pony Bottle. What was our previous show about, though? Uh, oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's right. You weren't here. That's right. Oh. It was uh, about the ISS twenty twenty four uh, death sentence date. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> jump, jump, jump. Okay. <laughs> like you'll get it in a second. Uh, <laughs> Thank is this, you. Is this a, no problem? A, a, like a pony in a bottle or a bottle painted like I didn't, a pony? I didn't actually ask. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, think how many historical, <laughs> even ancient buildings we have lost that we would love to have back. And now imagine hanging in space beside the International Space Station in your spacesuit and your tour guide's voice comes on through your helmet speakers. You're now looking at one of humanity's earliest and greatest achievements, the ISS. It is here that the technologies were developed that allowed your ancestors to colonize the planets and moons that you now call home. How is deorbiting the ISS even a thing? <laughs> I don't know. Ah! <laughs> oh, oh man! I think that summed up that entire comment. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think. Much. I think I think Space Mike nailed that particular one. Right? <laughs> I mean, it is it is big and expensive and in the way is the only thing. Yeah, it, it's right. Money. I mean, to be fair, it is money, and it's not like you can just leave it there and like it's not like you just go okay well we'll just let it sit there for another hundred years you need to keep it in orbit that's not free yeah right it costs money it costs cash cash money yo so yeah. i mean the money that we put into keeping it into orbit could be money we use to building a permanent colony on the moon so now space mike let me pose this question to you if you have the option of saving the International Space Station and taking the funds and ensuring that the International Space Station uh, stays in orbit and doesn't get mothballed, or you can mothball the space station, but you get a lunar colony, which one do you pick? I would, I, I would mothball it for the lunar colony, but only if we could somehow make it like a legal law that could not be changed with an administration change. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, it's guaranteed, right? So you're guaranteed. Guaranteed mood and call. Either one is guaranteed. Okay. Yeah, all right, so you, okay. guaranteed. I'll guaranteed. You mothball it. <laughs> Mo or, as long as it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Mothball it and go to the colony. I realize this is a faux situation. Nothing in life is guaranteed. But yeah. I'm just <laughs> You mothball moth Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was like, nothing in life is guaranteed, so uh, lunar colony. All right, now, actually, all right, so now let me change it a little bit. No longer guaranteed, normal politics, right? So a politician comes up and says, look, we got to deorbit this thing, but I'm going to take all the money at the space station, we're going to build a lunar colony, and we're going to do it in the next 10 years. Space Mike? Nope, no way. Jared? Uh, I propose a COTS-like program, but for maintaining the space station. So that, could, so that it can be turned to into a commercial sector. enterprise. Okay, interesting. I would absolutely hand it over to a commercial company if they wanted to take it. You? Yeah, because SpaceX they... even built back in the day. They even built like a small little service module that could be attached to the uh, the back of Zvezda when it ran out of fuel for station keeping. I, I think that got mothballed and may, might not have ever gotten built in the first place. But it was something that they were thinking about like way way back in the day, like 2006, 2007, maybe. Interesting. So yeah, caught doing a commercial program for a space station yeah. to keep it running and kind of, yeah, that's interesting. That would They're be have, awesome. You'd have to figure out the business model there, like how are they making money, right? Because the COTS program right now, mm -hmm. business model is, you know, they're launch services providers, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. uh, I, there may be one there. I'm just not sure what it is. All right, Capcom, up next. All right, next one comes also off of YouTube. This one is Joshua Boucher, Boucher. Boucher, possibly. Boucher. <laughs> uh, I think it would be interesting to put our combined wits to use the International Space Station and cannibalize it to combine with Bigelow pieces, if they can pan out as we hope. Uh, no reason to burn up the International Space Station completely. It is about 800 to 9,000 pounds of hardware and resources that still work. Yeah, I don't know why we would need to cannibalize it for a Bigelow station, though. I mean... 
I don't see what the advantage is. I'm just saying is. to can can cannibalize it and combine it with Bigelow pieces. And this isn't necessarily a new idea. So sorry, Josh, but there I've seen studies in the past where they've Sorry, Josh, yours, your idea is not original. Yeah. <laughs> it's not right, really, right, Josh. It's not idea, though. But even NASA has had this idea. There have been, there have been studies that have come out about, about disconnecting the still usable and still working pieces that you know aren't the oldest pieces and connecting them with newer modules and putting them in orbit around the moon or sending them off to one of the Lagrange points or anywhere. So that would be cool too. I think I might even be okay with that. Yeah. But, if, but in doing that, the historic thing that you know is the ISS today no longer exists. Yeah, but it's still being used. Part, I mean, parts of it are so, still being used. Yeah, and I, if, I've been fine with parts. With the, if we had somehow been able to save the Muir space station before it burned up unplanned and unscheduled, then they, they even planned to disconnect pieces from the Muir space station to be their Muir 2 space station. So, I mean, even if the Muir didn't burn up and they did do their original plan, like, I'd still feel way better about that. And I'd feel the same way about the ISS. Like, even if the original ISS didn't exist, if some of the pieces were reused for ISS-2 or whatever, you know, the Disney Space Station, whatever you want to call it, then I'd still be okay with that. I'd be just like, all right, you know, that's great. I'm glad that we didn't spend two bill, you know. You was know, that, was that, that your, my, my Space Bank, was that your attempt to get me to want to keep it no, to call no, it? No, 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 that was in the chat room. <laughs> oh, oh, I missed that. That was in the chat room. That was a good, that was, I, 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 I missed appreciate that. it. Where, where yeah. the, it was all over. Oh, are you kidding? Because somebody was like, no, oh, or Disney. Saw, and then Stoge was, was like, oh my God, Disney ISS. So yeah, it was all, yes. Good, I, I appreciated it. And, and Robert Bigelow even said that too, trying to, to sell more B-330s. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah, I saw that in the press conference and that was awkward and weird, by the way. It was, it was this <laughs> weird, like, maybe Disney will do it. And I was like, what? No, okay. All right, moving on. Capcom? That's like a tweet shout out though. You just add somebody just so they'll see it. Yo, at Disney, gonna <laughs> want like, a space station? Hashtag <laughs> Disney, hashtag space station, hashtag forever. Disney Vacation <laughs> Club? Space! <laughs> space edition! <laughs> Why ride Space Mountain when you could go to the top of the Space Mountain? Right. <laughs> I want to go on that ride. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Right, exactly. Well, I think everyone watching this show wants to go on that ride. Yeah. yeah. The problem is it costs, you know, $80 maybe, million uh, dollars per seat. Maybe Disney will buy a Falcon 9 and paint it like the TWA rocket. Oh um, my god, that would be so awesome. Wouldn't that be great? That would be so awesome. And then they'll, they'll put... You, they'll, oh, they'll oh the, legs, the, the legs need to be red on the existing... Oh, yes. how awesome would that be? And then then Disney <laughs> will just outright buy it and remove this, the fake TWA rocket and put a real one in at Disneyland. That would be awesome. That would be nice. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. Capcom. Capcom. Also off of YouTube, this one comes from Raziel. Raziel. Raz I can't pronounce that any other way. Uh, I think the cost to boost it to a significant higher amount higher so its orbit doesn't decay with these huge solar panels would be too high. Even then, you had to do regular course corrections because it would drift for solar winds and whatnot. Exposed to the Van Allen belt, the station would also become radioactive in the long run. And keeping a giant piece of radioactive metal in orbit is probably not the best idea. Get some souvenirs out. Uh, you can put it in a museum on Earth. Take some really nice pictures and deorbit the International Space Station. I think becoming a giant shooting star is not a bad way to end such a scientific uh, project. A big part of mankind would sit at the TV again and watch the station burn up live. That would be cool and it would, be, in my opinion, serve better to the future of space flight than letting it get dusty in space, metaphorically speaking. I think it gets moldy, remember, right? That's, that's what happens is the mold starts to grow on the inside. Maybe. I think. I think yeah. Yeah. They have like to do regular the walls. No, yeah. I'm not making that up. I think that's actually what happens is the mold starts to grow on the. Yeah. Gross. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nasty. Yeah. Nasty. Um, so, um, I don't necessarily disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, we are playing with high-powered magnetics that could kind of potentially, and I'm making this part up, but I see an application where maybe you could simulate our magnetosphere and kind of create a protective magnetic cone around the space station. Not today, someday in the future. Um, That'd be nice. Mm -hmm. To protect it from radiation. Uh, I was reading stories about these, these super ultra uh, electromagnets that we were developing that are like 10 times stronger than we have now. And in my mind, I was like, oh, maybe that would work on like spacecraft. So when we we're going to Mars, right. you know, we could protect the spacecraft. Because that's essentially what the magnetosphere is, right? Just a yeah. giant magnetic protection 
orb. Right. Makes all the cosmic rays go <laughs> Makes all the cosmic rays go whoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same with, uh, same with the, wind, the solar wind and everything as well. Welcome to all tomorrow. The, all the things makes all the cosmic rays go woo. Most of the things that give you cancer will go woo around it. Right. So, so uh, you know, we could potentially develop that. By the time we're ready to deorbit it, maybe we would have something that we could use to make it not become super radioactive. I will say this, if they're gonna deorbit it, I would like to put an entire suite of instrumentation in there so that we can study how it, how it breaks apart. Because that would, that would help us out a lot in designing spacecraft and things And like a that. live feed from the inside. That would be cool too. It needs too. to be like yeah. in a protective pod, uh -huh. like made out of whatever they make the black boxes on airplanes out of that can yeah. broadcast no matter what, so you can just watch it like just disintegrating. That'd be neat. That'd be pretty neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be cool because, I mean, otherwise, if they do this according to plan, no one should be able to see it. And if you do see it, then something went horribly, horribly <laughs> wrong and run for your lives. <laughs> well, you still see it. But, wait, wait, wouldn't you see it burn up in the atmosphere? Unless you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere, because that's the plan. Well, yeah, I mean, a boat. Cool, I'll get a boat. Oh, you want to be? You wouldn't want to be there. And in fact, they're probably going to do. I do a little bit want to be there. Sure no one is in the you know debris crash zone. I mean, it's a huge. I don't want to be in the debris no crash zone. Stop everyone. I don't want to be the debris crash. I want to be close enough where I can see it, though. You got to be able to see it from not inside the debris crash zone. <laughs> Shenaniganry, I call. All right, Capcom. I don't know. Next one comes from <laughs> Patreon. This is from John Bernstein. Or Benstead, sorry. Uh, the ISS is there, and as long as it is safe to use, we should keep it running. Case in point, the Opportunity rover. The rover has lasted long beyond its warranty. We should do the same with the ISS. I'd like to see Bigelow B-330 docked with the ISS. Yeah, uh, there's a price difference between running the two, though. Right? Yes. It comes down to money. And I know that sucks, but that's the cold, harsh reality of mm -hmm. it. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is... You know, running opportunity costs radically less than running the International Space Station. Yeah. So any money that we throw at the International Space Station is money that we can't use somewhere else. Now, that is a bit of a false way to look at it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me drink from this un amazing yeah. mug for a moment. I'm kinda, mm. You know, I, the, drinking from that side, I it didn't feel quite right. Let me try drinking from this side instead. This is fantastic. <laughs> if, if only, like, if I could go to, what, like, shop.tmro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If only there was a place you could purchase these at. Mm. That's delightful. Mm. Um, tastes like the future. <clears throat> tastes like the future. Like <laughs> like one day in the future. Tastes like one day in the future. Um, so bad? It's a it's a fault. <laughs> it, <laughs> it tastes. It's a false statement because uh, ultimately the money we put into our space programs, whatever we choose to put into our space program. So mm -hmm. if we choose that we want to have enough money for the International Space Station and enough money to do things like a lunar colony or Mars or whatever, then we will have enough money to do that. But we have to make that choice. So, um, but right now that's not how that works. We have a, I'm not saying that we could take money out of ISS and do a lunar colony. I'm simply using that as an example. But that's how it works today. That's the harsh reality of it. So there you go. All right. Yeah. Next there you up. go. Capcom. Next one. Uh, Holy cats, how many comments? Oh, I suppose we were off for like a ever. month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple comments. Uh, next one comes off of Twitter. This is from at Green Jim 2 uh, it says, here's an, an, here's an option for ISS 2024, future tomorrow. Use ISS as transition platform to future commercial orbital factories. Yeah, kind of that, cot we're back to sort of that COTS idea mm -hmm. again, right? Yeah. Where you, you kind of use it as a platform for commercial space. Not a bad idea. I kind of like the, I, I like the idea of using it as a platform for commercial space. I think that would uh, help create a whole new industry in space. Not, mm -hmm. not just a space industry, but an industry of people working in space. I think that would be, uh, ultimately, I think that should be our goal. Mm -hmm. Not just a space industry, but an industry in space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next one off of YouTube comes from Kim Peterson. It's actually a very, very exciting time for space nerds. Super ditto on that, Benjamin, on that line, Benjamin. I haven't been this excited about space exploration since Apollo. What an amazing show we're in for. Absolutely. I yes. think the next decade is going to be the best in aerospace since Apollo. Uh, I, I'm super excited. Yeah. Super duper, we, ultra, uber excited. We are truly in the golden age of space flight. 
This is this is we what it's all about. We are in the platinum age of we, space fighting. It's <laughs> like it's like when it's like when aviation was in the 1920s and 30s when you just watch the leaps and bounds of all of that and just uh, I, uh, it is incredible. So and, but because of the technology that we have now and we can watch this unfold in real time, yeah, being able to see this happening in real time with all these different, you know. And the, the ability to interact directly as well with he, some of the I, I just happening. emailed Firefly so. Space earlier today saying, hey, I want to bring you guys on the show because you're about to test your Aerospike engine later this year. Yeah. How <laughs> freaking cool is that, <laughs> right? I, the they haven't said ever. yes, I just emailed them going, hey, can I have someone <laughs> on a Saturday? I'm hoping they say yes, because. That would be nice. See, see, yeah, I mean, whole new types of engines, whole new types of spacecraft, whole new types of rockets, whole new types of business plans. What we're doing in space is incredible right now. Uh, I'm super excited we yeah. have this show. Yeah. All right, next up. Next one uh, comes off of YouTube. <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be terrible if I was like, eh. Next up. Eh, <laughs> you know, I guess. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Got a yeah. show about space, but meh. Uh, nah. Uh, All right, I'm sorry. Capcom. <laughs> this one comes off of YouTube uh, from Tio One John. Uh, Taiwan. I don't know why I always do that. Uh, Tio One John, yep. All right. That's the way it is T now. It's it's just, I've said it every single time this person has had a comment. I've always pronounced it that way, and I know it's wrong <laughs> every single time, and I still do it anyway, and I'm really sorry. <clears throat> All right, quote, Americans. Everyone is stepping up their live launch coverage game, end quote. This is true, and I'd say it's in no small part due to SpaceX leading the way. Great job. I don't know who does it over at SpaceX, but uh, I just want to say that uh, they do a fantastic job. Yeah. I, I would have to imagine that they're devilishly handsome and uh, just uh, very good at life in general. I, uh, I personally think they need better uh, lenses on their tracking cameras, but that's just me. Yeah, well, so. I mean, I'm just saying. Because, I mean, you should be able to see it for as far as you can. Mm. So. <laughs> you can't. Because, I mean, we isn't, saw the high-speed footage can, that Can't was just you see released. everything for so, as far as you can? Isn't, um, isn't like, I mean, just everything saying. you can see as far as, I can see that camera's for as far as I can? That's a silly <laughs> statement. You know, you're working, you're going into the world of philosophy, of which there is no definitive answer for anything. All right, that's fair. Finally, <laughs> finally, Capcom, let's close out this show. This yes. one comes off of Reddit from the Black Tom. Uh, <laughs> All, All right. right. Or the blacktum. I don't know. Blacktum. Right? Blacktum. Blacktum. Uh, okay. A lot of space to do with cool things now. It will be sketchy, rough, build it week after week, launch window after launch window, colonizing Mars, the new studio, hoping to first land live next decade, week. Week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the new studio is pretty incredible. Uh, we showed this before the show, but we'll show it right now. This, is, uh, this happened earlier this morning. We got our name on the door. Uh, so there you go. Uh, station, uh, and that's where the station names comes from. It's the unit number. So uh, tomorrow, station two zero four. Uh, it, it was really cool to have that applied to the door and make this space, you know, uh, actually ours. Um, I, I will say I, again, we, we could not have done this without you, our patrons, you, our citizens. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. We have very large plans for tomorrow as a whole, yes. above and beyond just space. Um, tomorrow, transit. Tomorrow. Um, Energy. Uh, energy, tomorrow tech, a bunch of different tomorrow shows that we do want to produce. They're not happening right now. We're focusing on tomorrow space for now. Uh, but it, it's going to be pretty incredible, and it's all enabled through you. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be a very slow build out process because we had to take all of our slush funds, all of the funds that we were saving up for the new uh, talk show unit for Skype so we could have multi-Skype callers, all of that went into the deposits for this space. So we have we have literally negative funds right now. Yeah. Uh, I, I went in my personal account went yoink. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, so it's 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 going to be cool. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be worth it. Um, and it's going to take a lot of time. And hopefully you guys enjoy watching us build this week after week on set. Um, much like tomorrow has grown year after year, and you've seen uh, like our first episodes were terrible, and you've seen us grow and flourish and turn into, a, a, I think, a quite a compelling show. They were Care. terrible. <laughs> they were terrible. I, you don't seem disagreeing, do you? You're sitting there thinking, and we're still terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're less terrible. We're less terrible. We're marginally awful. Just like the aerospace industry kind of had, you know, marginal improvements year over year, but now we're kind of getting into those, you know, much faster improvements. Yeah. I think you're going to see the same thing with tomorrow. 
where you're going to start seeing improvements much quicker now, and you're going to see the set go in much faster, and you're going to see a lot of really cool things. Also, because we have this space, I am opening it up to a live studio audience. Uh, we were talking about this before the show. So if you're in the Los Angeles or uh, Orange County area and you want to watch us do this recording live, feel free to pop on over. Just um, you mention it on Twitter. Uh, we'll, f we'll get a process for that going. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to have enough people that want to come week after week to fill like 30 people. But we could. We could put 20 to 30 people in this room. Also, right away, live. you might have to bring your own chair. Uh, you definitely have to bring your own chair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is, there are... Four chairs? No, there are five chairs in this entire... Yeah, there are five chairs in the entire suite. Yeah, five chairs. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> You're right. looking at three of them. <laughs> yes. Exactly. All right. That's our show this week. Uh, an abbreviated After Dark is up next. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.